that that song. Um, and every time I, I hear that song, those of you who know the words, what is that? What is the chorus? And he walks, walks with me, and he talks, talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tear every there, no other has ever known. Uh, I, 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 the second part of the chorus, this whole uh, group dropped here, and, and it was continued by this group. Um, no one says as we tarry there. What does tarry mean? <laughs> Not taro, tarry. <laughs> as we wait, as we kind of hang out there, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I mean, no one writes that, that those kind of words anymore. The, 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 the songs that we sing, the praise songs that we sing, are great songs. But, but no one writes uh, that, that, those kind of words um, anymore. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing that with us today. And we look forward to the, the second song that you will be um, uh, offering to the Lord this morning. It's Lent. Those of you who are, um, are paying close attention to the uh, schedule, uh, April 16th, I think that's what I said, April 16th or the second Sunday of, of um should be the second, the third Sunday of April is Easter. And so a lot of you um, are starting to see things that are happening in the media that talks about Jesus, talks about uh, uh, Christianity, and it's really the perfect season for agnostics and doubters and skeptics to come out because this is the, the holiest of days for all Christians. Uh, in fact, in the state of Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, either Oregon or Washington or both. Usually these two states are kind of get together to do these things. The uh, Church of Satan, or the Satanic group, has been uh, lobbying for, for time, uh, an after-school activity, so that they can teach to the children of the state of Oregon and Washington. And mind you, they are going to the public schools of, of, of this state. And the thing is, um, the, the interesting part of it is that in three weeks' time, if I'm not mistaken, that's what, how I was reading the article, in three weeks' time, these people were able to get the, um, the, the school districts in those states to give them the uh, opportunity and the ability to actually teach an after-school session uh, in, in the public schools. And, and the thing that is interesting about it is that they were picking the schools. They were not saying, okay, we're going to, 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 um, to cover all the schools, or maybe in this county only, but they um, actually said, specifically targeted, those schools with after-school activity, after activities that are sponsored by Christians. And so they're going to go head-to-head -head with the Christians and the satanic group, and I was wondering, what in the world are they going to teach? And, and so they were, they were, I was reading the part of that, um, the proposal that they were giving. And the proposal is to give lessons on, or to teach kids on confidence, to teach kids on self-esteem, to teach kids, you know, nothing was said there about we're going to teach kids evil, we're going to all dress up with horns and a fig and a fork. They didn't say that, but it sounds really good, right? Self-confidence, self-esteem. And all these wonderful things that um, that some of uh, some of the uh, parents are probably going to go. That's not so bad. That's not so bad. And of course, they don't call themselves the Satanic Club. They don't call themselves that. They call themselves something else. So it's not called that. Uh, but accor according to this article that I was reading, no one has signed up yet, which is good. I don't know if they were going to sign up later on. But for some reason, Lent uh, brings that out into the open. Many many questions come out of the surface. And there comes a time when we, uh, during that time, we lose faith or we lose our strong beliefs. I mean, every Lent, there's always something from CNN that either looks for Jesus, seeks for Jesus, is Jesus real? And so it, do you really think that they are just putting up these shows because that is what they believe? It's not only that, but they are catering. Catering to the society because the society is having that. The society is, is full of skeptics. The society that we have nowadays is losing faith, losing our strong beliefs. We start asking questions because everyone else is asking questions. 
the top minds, the educated ones, the powerful ones. We get into the same mix and we allow our faith to get eroded. He says that, he yells at me when he hears my voice. We get into the same mix and we start allowing uh, our faith to get eroded into big question. In fact, many of us sometimes become very cynical and we lose this, this faith that we have, this childlike faith. And, 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 and is it because we're getting older? Is it because we are not going to Sunday school anymore? When we, when we just take everything with faith and no matter how impossible it sounds, we used to do that. No matter how impossible it sounds, we just take it. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 14. Let the children come to me, he said. Don't stop them. <clears throat> For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now he's not saying the, the kingdom of heaven only belongs to them. And all of you are not children anymore while you're out of the loop and so goodbye. He's not saying that, but look at what he said. The kingdom of heaven this kingdom of peace and joy and, 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 and salvation belongs to people who are just like this, who think like this. And what is he speaking about? He's talking about the faith that a child has. Jesus was teaching his disciples that it was people who have faith like a child that are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Exactly what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at one of the stories that, um, that, that is being told to us today in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. The story about Jesus, and of course Jesus is healing. And, and many times uh, we, we lose our, our childlike faith when it comes to being healed, right? Many of us, when we go, um, me included, uh, one of the things that, that have, um, and, and this will basically tell you how old I am, that has terrified me is that as soon as I hit that age, I started getting something from Kaiser saying, you have to go, you have to come for your what? A colonoscopy. You know the magic age. Do not, I don't want to hear. Um, uh, you, you, that, that's that's the, the age that when you pass that, at least for women, I don't know about men, um, uh, you're, you're supposed to have a little, is it also? Say, I don't know. Uh, you have to go for your colonoscopy. And for those of you who do not know what a colonoscopy is, uh, Evelyn is over there, go ask her. Uh, but that's, that's just uh, sounds so invasive and everything. And so, you know, because, uh, you know, and, and I've been given brochures, I've been receiving um, things that are colorful with birds and flowers. Tell me, the colonoscopy is not that bad. And, and so I'm supposed to go. And so, and so when it comes to colonoscopy, I, I do lose my childlike faith. I do lose it because it's like, I don't want to go because I know it hurts. And they all say, it doesn't hurt. They put you to sleep. Well, what if I don't wake up anymore? Or, um, or here's the biggest thing. And I know that not just me, but everyone else has this thinking. What if they find something? What if they find some alien growing in there? I don't know. And so I'm going, dear Lord, just take me now. I don't want to go through colonoscopy. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teacher of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. By the way, these are people, not children. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the spirit, the evil spirit, you deaf and mute 
unclean spirit, I said, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him pri privately, why couldn't we drag it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. What is happening here? If, if you read a little bit before that, if you read that, the, not the history, but the setting, this is in. It seems like the disciples have lost something. They've lost their, their, their mojo. Uh, some people would say they've lost their faith. Uh, just before this, uh, this is the part where they, they went up to the mountain and they saw Jesus, they saw Elijah, they saw Moses standing and talking together. Well, I don't know about you, but after seeing that, I, I, I can't even imagine seeing something like that. But I'm so sure that at, that at that point, they have all the faith that they have. Because, you know, even Peter said, why do we need to come down? Let's just stay here, Lord, and we'll build something for you. You know, we'll, we'll build something for you. Don't worry. If we need food, I'll go down and get some fish and bring it up here. But we don't have to go down. Let's just stay here because this is the most wonderful time to be in. My faith is overwhelming. But Jesus didn't know we got to do that. Then after that, I'm so sure he still has that faith. And yet this is not happening. And so after Jesus had gone indoors in verse 28, his disciples asked him privately. They don't even want to ask him in public. They ask him privately, you know, what's going on? How come we cannot drive that spirit out? What happened that they have lost their faith? And I'm not saying that they've lost all their faith. They've lost some of them, a shaving of it. But more importantly, what happens to us? And that has happened to the disciples. What happens to us when we lose our faith? And that's the thing. I'm not talking about you turning away from the Lord. I'm just talking about every single day, things are happening at work, things are happening at church, things are happening with your family, things are being said between husband and wife, and being, being parent and children, between siblings, between friends, between relatives, on Skype, on text. And, and, and somehow, something is amiss. Something is shaking. Something is not well grounded anymore. And for some reason, we're losing that faith. Or maybe one day we get a letter in the mail that says, you are going to be audited. Oh, we'll grieve. Or maybe we get a call from our doctor that says, you need to come real quick. You need to come. I need to see you. Or, or, or others might, might hear this. I was talking to a friend uh, a week ago. And instead of uh, them, you know, when they called the doctor and said, you know, this person feels this way, instead of saying, well, let's, let's go ahead and schedule you for an appointment, this friend of mine heard this instead, take him to the ER now. But I don't know about you. I don't know if my faith will be 100% there. Maybe a little bit shaving, a little bit of the shaving of faith happens as well. Well, see, people lose faith. Because sometimes, and, I, and I'm talking about, I'm talking to people, not just who do not know the Lord, even those who know the Lord. We lose our faith because our faith, faith is based on church. Our faith is based on religion. Our faith sometimes is based on denomination. You, know, you start talking to um, my family in the Philippines where, where they've been staunch, uh, um, um, Members of the Yemenist Church, and those of you who don't know the Yemenist Church, is the uh, Evangelical Methodist Church in the Philippines, the Independent Medical Method, uh, Methodist Church in the Philippines, where they all, you know, all the, all every day when they speak, they, they speak and they, they preach in Tagalog, and yet their name is in Spanish. I have no idea why, why that's so. But you know, the, the, the people lose our faith. When we talk to, to people who have been in a religion, in a denomination for the longest time, they, their faith is on that, based on that faith, based on that religion, based on that denomination. You've, hear, you've heard people say, I'm going, I am a blank. I will die a blank. Fill in, the, fill in the blank. It's up to you. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a whatever. And I will die a blank, blank, blank. Whatever it is that you want to put in there. We 
have started to lose faith because our faith is based on that religion, based on a denomination, based on a set of, of rules, instead of a relationship with the living God. Uh, maybe the disciples were thinking, okay, this is what Jesus did when he drove out the enemy. Let's, let's just do the same thing. This is how he stood. This is what he said. This is how he, uh, how he appeared. You know, his, his arm is this way. Then the other arm is this way. Okay, whatever that is. Okay, so, so this is how we're going to do it. I'm not saying that that's how the disciples did it. And it didn't work. But many times we look at a set of rules and a set of traditions and a set of things what we used to do, the church does, instead of our relationship with the living God and base our faith there. Some of us grew up in homes where our perception of Christianity was a set of rules. Parents, one of the biggest challenges we have with our kids, we, I don't have a kid, but I'm sure this is one of the biggest challenges you have with your kids because I was once a kid. And, and I, I'm sure one, this is one of the biggest challenges with, that my parents have up to now. It's instilling right and wrong into them without loading them down with rules and squeezing the childlike faith right out of them. Look at the religious leaders in the story that we just read. The religious leaders were probably telling the disciples, you have no authority or ability to heal this boy. The disciples in the meantime were trying to prove the religious leaders wrong. No, we're going to show them. We're going to show them that we can do this because we're with that guy over there. The father says with a little bit of exasperation in his voice, the father of the boy said, I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they could not do it. People lose their faith because we base our faith not on a relationship with the living God, but on a set of rules, in a building, in a denomination, in, 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 in something that we think, in even church. People not only lose faith because they never had a relationship with Jesus in the first place or they forget that relationship, but we lose our faith because we have experienced failure before. Failure can rob us of our faith. The disciples were here trying to be a force for good. They were trying to bring their relationship with Jesus to bear on something great. The healing of a young man and the result was complete and utter humiliation. Each blunder that we make, each piece of wrong word we say, each attempt to share our faith to our family and friends that goes terribly wrong, chips another block off our childlike faith. Takes a shaving out of that faith. We need to learn that failure is an event. It's an event that happens in our lives. It's not a person. God doesn't look down at us expecting to see a string of successes. He looks wanting to see growth in us. The third way we can lose our faith is when we get disappointed. Each unanswered prayer it's interesting, we, uh, we, we talk about prayer and we, um, we, um, we, we, we look at our prayer requests. And again, I was talking to a friend of mine and, and I was saying, you know, she, she was asking, how are you? And I said, well, it's, it's, it's all right, you know. I just have my, my biggest problem right now is my, my supervisor. I go, but you know, hey, life goes on. And she was saying, don't worry, I'll add you to my list. And her list is long. <laughs> Her list is long, and one of the things that we talked about is like, when is that list going to be blank? There are some prayer requests that we have that has never been answered, that has, hasn't been answered, and each unanswered prayer just sucks the life out of our faith. How long I, as a pastor, have prayed that the Lord change, uh, that, the, that the Lord grow this church? How long have I asked for the Lord to bring people to this church? How long have you prayed that the Lord change your husband? How long have you prayed for the Lord to change your wife? How long have you prayed? He got, he got um, embarrassed. <laughs> I think he said, too long, that's what he said. Each unanswered prayer is basically shaving our faith, takes a shaving out of our faith. 
And when we plead and work and strain for an answer to some problem and the response is silence, that it can sap the faith right out of you. A lot of people say, you know, yeah, we know that, that the three ways, the normal three ways that the Lord answers of, um, of prayers. What is it? Yes? Well, not the Pastor Jay version. So we'll, we'll do that another day. Uh, Pastor Jay's version has four. But, you know, uh, we yes, and there's a no, and there's a wait. The wait is the worst. We, we even take no for an answer, right? Because at least you have an answer. At least you have an answer to your prayer. Oh, no, all right. I guess that's not going to work. Of course, yes is the best. Yes is great. No is great. But wait is the worst. Because at that each unanswered prayer that you're supposed to wait for just sucks the life out of us. And the response is usually silence. And that's how we find this father. I can only imagine being the father at the point in time, the desperation that he must have felt. Maybe the humiliation he was feeling. All eyes were on him, but also the disappointment that he must have been feeling. Maybe at first he tried uh, going to the religious leaders at the local temple, only to have them come up empty-handed again. Maybe they even blamed him for the son's medical and spiritual problems. Word at this time was probably spreading um, about the disciples and Jesus and his ministry. And so he's hearing this all the time, and I'm like, oh, this is it. This is the answer to my prayer. He'd already fed the multitude. I heard him perform numerous healings. So he finds the disciples and like, this is it. My prayer is going to be answered. I would imagine that at this point, the father is getting excited. One step closer to a cure. One step closer to a cure. But he was disappointed again. So when this dad sees Jesus, he probably is at a low in his faith. He's a skeptic at this point. He is beyond cautious now. When Jesus asks him, how long has this been going on? You can almost hear the hopelessness in his voice when he says, since he was very small. Since he was very young. Can you hear recitation in his voice? Jesus hears it too. He even heard it in the question that the Father asked us. The evil spirit often makes him fall into the fire and into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us do something if you can. And if you are the father, I, I, I have to be thinking that this father is saying, I wish he would just die. So that it will just, you know, save him from the misery. But no, he, he falls into fire. He falls into water trying to kill him. But he is not dead. He's still here. Do something if you can, he said to Jesus. He has gone to Jesus because he is at the end of his rope. Have we ever been in that position? We are at the end of our ropes. He's tried everything else, but he's been disappointed so many times. Jesus responds by putting this father back on track into a childlike faith. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked, anything is possible if a person believes. You see, childlike faith believes that God has the power to do anything. A faith that is childlike is a faith that recognizes that accomplishing, impo is, uh, in, um, accomplishing impossible feats is all about God's ability and strength. <clears throat> you know, I'm glad my sister is here. Because what I'm sure one of the things that is heaviest on her mind as she tries to come here with her husband is when is that going to happen? When is that visa going to clear? <clears throat> When are they going to call me for an interview? Though some of you have some, something impossible on your plate, and you're looking at it and you're going, I don't know when that's going to come. I don't know when I'm going to be healed. I don't know when that this, 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 this doubt is going to go away. Accomplishing impossible feats is all about God's ability and his strength. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with culture. It has everything to do with God's ability and his strength. It has nothing to do with rules. It has nothing to do with church. It has everything to do about God's ability and his strength. That second principle is found in verse 24. The father instantly replied, I do believe. Here's, here comes the childlike faith. But help me not to doubt. 
A person with childlike faith admits, admits unbelief and asks for help. That's the childlike faith that Jesus is talking about. Childlike faith isn't perfect faith. It cannot be, oh, I have so much faith, you know? No. It's like, Lord, I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. There is always room for doubt in our lives. But the doubt doesn't win. Belief prevails all the time. God, is, God doesn't expect perfection from us. When you start hearing yourself say, I have better faith than that person over there, you better start shaking it and be nervous that you actually said that. Oh, I have better faith than that. God doesn't expect perfection, but He does expect honesty and transparency from us. Don't think that He will disappoint God with a prayer that says this, God, I know that it is impossible to please you without faith. I have faith, but I need you to make it better. I need you to strengthen this faith. I need you to bolster it. I believe He will, come, he will answer that kind of prayer. The third and last principle of childlike faith is found in verses 25 to 27. And I asked um, uh, the girls to bring that back up for us again. 25 to 27. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet. And he stood up. A person with childlike faith watches as God does the impossible. We read the story of Jesus healing two blind men in Matthew 9. The blind men came to Jesus and asked Jesus to heal them. And Jesus asked them, do you believe that I can heal you? And they replied by saying, oh, we do. Jesus heals them and then says to him, because of your faith, he says to them, I'm sorry. Because of your faith, it will happen. And suddenly they could see. That seems to indicate that God works in our lives according to our faith. God works in our lives according to our faith. Do you have faith? Do you have faith that I can do that? God is asking us. Jesus is asking me. Do you have faith that I will protect you? That I will take care of you? That I will heal you? And he's asking you the same question. Could it be that God is barely visible in our life because our faith in Him is actually barely visible as well? There's one last ingredient, though, that is found in the concluding verses of Mark 9 when the disciples go to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, how come we cannot do that? How come we can't do what you just did? You've been telling us that we can do this. Jesus says, Prayer. Remain in me, John 15, 4, 5. One of my favorite verses, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful apart from me. Yes, I am the vine. Jesus said, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. There, there it is. There's the answer. That the Lord can only answer our prayers with that faith. Maybe we are expecting God to do great things in our lives. But if I'm honest, I have to admit that in my order of priorities, sometimes God is pretty low on my list. Maybe sometimes when people ask me, so how are you? What are the biggest problems in your life right now? Instead of me saying, oh my goodness, my supervisor is hell. Instead of saying that, I should say, you know what? I need a better prayer time. You know, my problem right now is I don't have time for the Lord. And be honest with what is limiting our faith. When God is pretty low on our list, that means we don't spend time necessarily, necessary in developing our faith. Before this, the disciples came down, as I said, with Jesus after appearing with Moses and Elijah. It's this mega happening, most exhilarating thing, the most blessed event in the life of a fisherman turned disciple. And yet the next thing we know is that they were arguing amongst themselves. And the next thing after that, they cannot heal. And in our lives, there are a lot of time being spent in a religion. There's a lot of time spent wondering how much we're risking and not getting the results that we want. There's a lot of time being spent thinking of disappointments and not enough time believing and ultimately <coughs> praying. Maybe there are those of you in this room who may want to ask, who may want to think of this challenge and not just 
join me in the challenge, but actually do this challenge. Asking for a change in life and a change of direction that instead of thinking, this is my problem. I have this problem at work, I have this problem in the family, I have financial problems, I have health problems. Maybe the biggest problem we have is that when is it that I'm putting God as a priority in my life and developing my faith that way? To get back to the childlike faith, to have the Lord work within us and get rid of the doubts, the cynicism, and the routines of my unbelief. There's always a cleaning that the Lord can do. If there's a lot of doubts, if there's a lot of sins, there's always a cleaning that the Lord can do in our lives. One of the best, and I might have said this before, one of the best lines in the movie Bruce Almighty, it may not be a very Christian movie to some of you, I think it is to me. One of the best lines in that movie uh, was with God, played by Morgan Freeman. <coughs> God was walking and after he mopped this huge room, and it's all nice and white and, you know, clean, he said in his Morgan Freeman God voice, there we go, wonderful thing. No matter how filthy something gets, it can always be cleaned right up. Amen? Mm -hmm.